Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1. We want to continue in our brief study of the book. Esther chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 22. You know, maybe you've heard of this, maybe you haven't, but it first appeared in something called chaos theory and eventually kind of worked its way over into this idea of weather and meteorological patterns, but it's this idea called the butterfly effect. Anybody? Butterfly? Okay, a handful of people. Um, but it, it's not as complicated as it might sound. But what, what happened was they were, they were studying especially uh, weather patterns, and uh, this, goes, this goes back a ways, and, and, and he was putting in some of the figures, and, and what was coming out of the computer was uh, wildly different than what, what they anticipated. And so like the outcome of some of these weather patterns, they had like these mathematical formulas, and, and he was trying to figure out, like, wait, I put in the same basic figures, and the outcomes out on the other side are totally different. And he's trying to figure out exactly why. And so he actually started looking, and this goes back a ways when you look at it, because, you know, he went to check the vacuum tubes on the computer. So we're going back to the time when, you know, computers were the size of houses, not the size of, you know, like, you know, fit in your pocket. But he realized what had happened was they had just rounded some of the numbers. And so when you got to the decimal point, you know, we do this all the time. You go a couple places and you just round maybe that last number. And he said he had done that. They had used these round numbers. But depending on where and how they did it, and when it happened in the beginning, that very slight variation over the course of time, figuring it, it compounded upon itself to actually come out and, and massively affect the outcome. And they realized that this was happening in weather because like, sometimes it, it wasn't these massive changes that, that resulted from what, what's the difference between a sunny day and like a hurricane somewhere. It was actually these very slight modifications sometimes where you could have all basically the same conditions, but the, the topography of the land or, or just a slight temperature variation from here or here would have this massive effect. And the reason it became called the butterfly effect is because they started summarizing it this way. Uh, a butterfly can flutter its wings over a flower in China and cause a hurricane in the Caribbean. But they started realizing, like, that's not really that far from the truth. Because the changes were so infinitesimal and so small in the beginning and at the outset, it looked like not a big deal. What's the difference between rounding something slowly up or down when you're multiple decibel points in? And yet they found that over time it magnified itself. One meteorologist summed it up this way that if this theory of the butterfly effect were correct, one flap of a seagull's wings would be enough to alter the course of the weather forever. He goes on to say, the controversy has not been settled, but the most recent evidence seems to favor the seagulls. Now, as far as I can tell, it is still a theory, but it's an interesting one. And it does certainly like, play out where we realize sometimes very small changes in something, especially early on, can have a massive effect on the outcome of seemingly unrelated events. And when we get to the story of Esther, we see that principle being played out here right before our very eyes. And that simple event that we look at here is simply the word no. Not K-N-O-W, no, like N-O, no. That word changes the course of human history, specifically for the Jews, but we've probably all been affected by it to one degree or another. But it's such a small little word. Had it not been said in some form in the book of Esther, we might not even have the book of Esther, or it would be fundamentally different than what we have before us. It's that big. It's not that much different than, you know, you throw a stone or an object in the water and that ripple effect, you know, that it goes in in just a small area, but that ripple effect just continues to go out and out and out and out. And it, and it covers eventually that body of water. And her no is truly something like that. That ripple effect affected so many people in such a vast amount of time. And yet when you looked at it and the people that knew that it was going on saw that and thought, What's the big deal? It seems insignificant. It seems like this has no bearing on my life whatsoever. And they had no idea how wrong they actually were. See, for us, what that means is that God can take the smallest details of your life and allow that to impact it on a massive level. And there are going to be details sometimes that you're going to look and you're going to completely ignore or overlook or dismiss. Or just consider, like, that was never relevant. That wasn't a big deal. And God will change your entire life. You think God isn't doing anything in your life? Guess again. You just don't realize what it is that God is doing in your life. You have to look. 
And sometimes that look, that gaze, that backward gaze goes back years sometimes for you to really begin to grasp and understand all that God might be doing. And we'll give you some illustrations as we go along there, but we, you have to understand that God is so great. He doesn't need to perform an out-and-out out supernatural miracle in your life to affect change and to change your life forever for the good or even the worse. He simply needs a word. And when you realize that God can change your life with a word, you'll stop thinking in the day-to-day -day, uh, paths of your life that God is not doing something. You might not understand it. You might not see it. But it doesn't mean that he's not there. Let's read verses 10 through 12. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bestha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs, and, th and this the king became, excuse me, at this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. And we'll stop there. God intervenes with a word. And as we come into this passage, this idea here, we're finding feasting going on. And if you remember, I said that feasting, eating, plays a huge role in the book of Esther. We find it everywhere. I don't know if they're somehow related to like the Baptists, where everything revolves around food or not. It makes you kind of wonder. But here they are doing this again. And this feast is one of those where you look at it and you like, Why? Now, we know it's different because we've just finished one off where we had that 180-day, that six-month feast that they were going on there. But verse 5 tells us specifically that this is something different. In verse 5, it says, And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both small and great, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And that, that what those days were completed is that the verse before, that 180-day feast, it's separate. It's something else. It's something different that's going on here. Exactly what it is, we're not sure, but it is unique. And what we find here is that Vashti also is giving her own little kind of a feast specifically for the women or for the ladies. Now, that's unusual because then, as, as now, like, like the, the men and the women would eat together. That's the normal way that it was doing it. But these, for whatever reason, they're divided. They're split up as this is going on here. And some people think that this actually might be Vashti and Xerxes' wedding as they're preparing for this. And then the seventh day, they would come together, uh, the formal ceremony and uniting and everything else like that. It's hard to say for sure, but that's a possibility. But however or whatever is going on, we get to the seventh day as here. And what we find here is that the king is merry with wine. We would just say in our more common vernacular, he's drunk. Nothing good is ever going to come from a situation like that. But that's where he's at. He's drunk. And he decides to show off the beauty of his queen to those in attendance at this feast of his. And to put it in proper context, this is not a meet and greet. This is not some kind of a formal way of like, let me introduce to you the queen. And he goes and gets her and brings her in. He could have done that. He could have made this big fanfare and, and, and brought her in and, sh and showed her, introduced her to the guests that probably had maybe come from all over the place. And instead he doesn't. He sends those seven eunuchs, whose names I can barely pronounce, and, and goes and go get her and bring her here. And you think about that for a minute, and you realize he's, he sends those eunuchs off to get her as if she's a piece of his property. And I think that's probably how we thought about her. He's going to show her off to the guests the same way that he had been showing off all of his gold and silver and linens and the finer things from previously before. He's going to show her off. Let me show you and demonstrate to you the absolute beauty of a queen that I have here. It's not going to work. Now, that begs the question a little bit, like, exactly what is he doing here? Like, we understand the showing off the beauty. He's going to show her up. But what, what does that mean here, especially when it comes to wearing her crown? And to be fair and honest with this, that there, there's a lot of question. Like, what exactly did that entail or mean? You know, it's funny because the ancient rabbis and, and maybe even some of the more modern ones looked at that and thought, well... What he was actually saying and actually doing was he was inviting her to come wearing her crown and only her crown, like nothing else, just 
her crown. Let them see her great beauty. And that's kind of the way that they took it. I can remember somebody somewhere uh, saying they thought maybe that she was actually just pregnant. She was just kind of like, you know, not comfortable and didn't really want to be seen by, you know, guests and things like that. And so maybe that's one of the reasons why she hesitated. Not sure. The one I like the best particularly here, especially if this happens to be her wedding, is the idea when he calls her to be wearing her crown, typically what she would also be having is a, a veil covering her face. And he's like, no, 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 don't cover that up. Let them see your beauty. So she's fully clothed, but she's wearing her crown, but her face is there before everybody. And I know that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but here's the thing. It's the insinuation. Even to this day, when you go over to many of those Middle Eastern countries, you see that they, 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 they take the way that their women are viewed very seriously. They're completely covered. There's always a veil over their face. And certainly some of that probably carries over from even this time in history and before that. But for her specifically, assuming she's not yet married, to not wear a veil was to insinuate that she is unchaste, perhaps not even a virgin. And so here she is, possibly on her wedding. It's not yet been consummated, and she's coming in, presenting herself like that. Everybody's able to see her, and it really is an affront, an attack on her person and on her character, and really even a, a uh, derogatory view on her family. Assuming those things are true, you can understand why she was like, uh, no, I'm going to bring dishonor to my family, dishonor on myself. I can't do this. I can't do this. I shouldn't do this. And she says no. Now, even if she's, they're not married, she still could be queen. They would have been betrothed, much like Mary and Joseph were betrothed later on. But we don't know. Not for sure. And that's actually a common theme all throughout the book. We don't know. The narrator that we have here likes to just make, he doesn't give assessments. He never tells us how we should think. He simply reports what is. You know, everywhere else in Scripture, we always are told, you know, that you know, the narrator cl uh, cl clues us in, like God was displeased with these decisions, or God was pleased with these decisions, or this was, this is wrong and sinful, or this was that. And, and we know how to think. We know the, the take and the angle that we're supposed to take there. We don't have that here. I, you know, it's kind of one of those things, I wish the news in our day and age would take that approach. Just simply report what's going on. Don't give me your assessment. Just tell me what's going on here. Let me figure it out for myself. But when it comes to the Bible, this is the only, this is the only source that we really have. And we're like, what do I do here? I'm not 100% sure. But, even though we don't fully understand the king's request or the queen's refusal, we do want more. And I think it makes us think and lean into this passage a whole lot more. We do know that the king was drunk. We do know that the queen said no. And it only heightens for us that this was not a good situation for anybody involved. And as the narrator continues to do that all through the book, he's drawing you in. And he's making you think and making you ask questions and making you search like, well, maybe we can find a detail here. Dig into your passage. Look around. Maybe do some cross-referencing. Maybe you'll find something. And maybe you will. But he's making you think. He's making you put yourself in there. Consider what you would do in situations like that. It also begs the question here from time to time as we look at specifically this one, like, wait, she disobeyed the king. Is there ever a time where it might be right to disobey the king? Then and now? That's also a conversation that we can have. And I don't think we should look at this because they're not really treating this like a husband and wife situation. They're really looking at it from a government perspective. King versus the people. The king versus the queen. More governmental. That's why they deal with it in edicts rather than they deal with meritable um, relationship situations later on, as we'll see. But is it ever right to disobey the king? Is it ever right to disobey the government? And I think the question we have to come up with at the end of the day is like, yeah. Yeah. We look at Vashti, and no, we don't understand the full context of what's going on here. We look at that and it says, she was right to say no. Whatever was at being asked of her specifically was wrong, and she was right to refuse that. However, there's a caveat that we must consider as we're going into this. She does not avoid consequence. 
I'm not saying those consequences are justified. It's just you have to understand that when you rise up, when you say no, that can bring about consequences that sometimes go far beyond your control and far beyond your imagination of what those things might be. You have to count the cost. And you probably have no idea what that cost might be. But the question I think we always want to do is, how can I take a stand for what is right or what I believe in and not be affected, not be hurt by it? Because we know that there's consequences for action sometimes, and sometimes they're dire. Like, how can I prevent that? And the, the reality is, like, you can't. Or at least you can't guarantee that nothing will happen. I present to you the, the, the baker in Colorado, Jack Phillips, who has been uh, in the news for a long time, and you can remember what happened, what initiated that conversation, that, that concept was the fact when, when a, a same-sex couple was, was having him, wanted him to make for them their wedding cake, and he said, no, I can't. It goes against my values as a believer. I don't want to be seen as supporting this. And he politely and kindly said no. I think he even tried to steer them to other bakeries that would more than accommodate them. And he had known them for a while, and they were friendly, and he had done many other things for them. But he said, I, I just can't do this here. And, of course, then they sued. Do you realize that was 2012? That feels like forever ago. And I was looking him up, and you know what? He's still in the news because everybody keeps, like, he got out of that one, so to speak. He was able to kind of to, to bypass that, but he was in the news. And I think there was a ruling against him just in June, last month. Because now, it's interesting because, because the words that he said in testimony dealing with that case specifically are now they're trying to use against him. Because he said, it's not, it's not the, the person, it's the principle of what this is. I would make birthday cakes, I would do all these other things, but I wouldn't do this. And so someone reading that story said, oh, would you now? And so, so, so she, and I think she's always been a she, but, but she said, hey, I, I want you to make a birthday cake for me. And he's like, okay, no problem, I do that all the time. But he said, I, she said, I want the theme of that to be my transitioning from male to female. And so I want the interior of the cake to be blue and the out, out exterior to be pink or vice versa, I can't remember which way it was going. You get the point. And he's like, we can't do that. And the amazing thing is, I'm reading this article on CNN, and, and I'm like, and how is this not entrapment? Well, the article was reading my mind, too, because it says, like, that, oh, no, no, it's not entrapment, because he's like, you know, I was trying to prove a point and kind of investigate certain things, not just get him in trouble. And I was like, so it's not entrapment. You realize that's exactly what everybody's going to think, and you're going to deny what it is, when that's exactly what it is. How does that work? And he lost. Now, thankfully, in this particular case, it looks like the only thing he loses is like a $500 fine assessed against him, but it sets certainly a precedent. But here he is, he's trying to do the right thing, and he lost, and it cost him. It's not fair. It's absolutely not fair, but it is what is. This brings to mind 1 Peter 2, verses 20 through 21. It says, For what credit is it if when you sin or are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. What you see there is the fact that, like, hey, you know, if you do wrong and you're held accountable for that, well, that's what's supposed to happen. That's justice, right? Nobody's going to pat you on the back. That's what's supposed to happen. But when you do right and you're punished for it, he says that is a gracious thing in the eyes of God. Why? Because that's exactly what Christ did. Christ came down and he modeled not just a good life, but the perfect life, and they killed him for it. And he says, when you stand up for what is right and you do what is right and you are punished anyway, you are modeling the very thing that Christ did when he came to this earth. And he says that is a good and that is a gracious thing. What does that mean long term for us? That doesn't mean that we avoid consequence. I think really what that means is that when we get to heaven someday, God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He said, that doesn't help me in the here and the now. It might not change your circumstances. But to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God's going to look at that and say, it is a good and gracious thing what you have done. Peter writes that to sustain you. He writes that to encourage you, that it is worth it, that it will be worth it. 
but don't expect to avoid the consequence. Esther's a great example here. We'll, we'll get to it eventually later, but Esther's a great example of those who do the right thing and somehow manage to avoid the, the, the dark side of that. She takes a stand and risks a lot of things, and it works out for her. It's okay, but Vashti and the baker, not so much. And to be fair, Esther has at least a few days to prepare for what she is going to do. Vashti probably has merely moments but that's how it is sometimes. Why does she suffer? Why does Vashti suffer? Because God is working, not for her, but for his people. But it all starts with her simple words that aren't even, none, none of her words or language is recorded for us, but, it's all, but we know the insinuation is no. See, God can work in your life and truly do some amazing things in it, and it doesn't require the parting of the Red Sea to do it. See, that's what we look for. We think, if God's going to work in my life, he has to do this big, huge miracle, like the parting of the sea, to clear the way that I can go across unencumbered by anything that's going on around me. That's what we look for. And if that's how you think that God is going to be involved in your life, you're going to be sorely disappointed. God doesn't need to part the Red Sea in order to be effective and be working in your life. He can simply use the words of a pagan queen and change the entire course of history. But we often forget that. But as we know here, it's going to be okay here. But God shows us he can work through really anything, and he sets in motion an entire set of events that are going to change the lives of the Jews. Years later, not tomorrow, but years later. And it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a word. God can do anything. You know, the fact that, you know, you're, you're on your way home today, and you decide, well, let's stop a quick trip and pick up a pizza on our way home, and, and not realizing, you know what, that's the thing. That delay that you have is going to be something as simple, and it will avoid an accident later on that you would have been involved in. And we say, well, you don't know that. I don't. You don't know the reverse of that either. We don't know what God is going to do through that. We, you might go to Quick Trip, buy that same pizza, and it may not be the accident. It might be the fact that you have a gospel conversation with someone that you've been looking for, or you didn't even know existed, and God sets this up, and you can talk to them. You don't know. See, it, God is working, and he's involved, and he does so through the sm simplest of things and the smallest of things. And most of the time, God is going to use very ordinary and seemingly insignificant events in your life. As I said, there are going to be things that you're going to write off, and you're going to think, no big deal, or it would have happened anyway. And like, all of these things are coming to pass, and they're, you, you want to ignore it, and what you're finding is they're actually Red Sea moments. They're God parting the sea, parting the way that something can happen. And you think it's no big deal. But it is. Vashti's refusal is what will eventually lead to Esther's eventual crowning and the salvation of the Jews. So look for God and the disordered desires of others that God can and will work through them somehow. Not overnight, not right away, but watch what God will do. You'll be surprised. But God can also work even through the disordered decisions when it wasn't just simply a desire that the king had and she says no to, then the king suddenly acts on this and does this massive decree and it really makes things, ratchets up the tension and everything and God is still there. He's still working. Let's read some more here, starting in verse 13 to the end of the chapter. And then the king said to the wise men, who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marius, uh, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw that the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus, uh, delivered by the eunuchs. Then Mamukin said in the, in the presence of the kings and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the towns and provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say King Ahasuerus commanded the queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will say the, the, the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. 
If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, her royal position to another who is better than she. Who when, uh, so when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. And this advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mamukim proposed. And he sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in his own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. God intervenes in a decision. And there's actually some humor in the horror. The king does what kings do. He turns and looks to his advisors and what should I do? Now, in and of itself, that's not a bad thing. It's not bad to look to the help of others, like get some advice on things, but be careful who you ask. These advisors are said here to know the times. And what that really means is they knew how to read the stars. They were involved in astrology. That's how they were supposedly knowing the times. Obviously, Scripture does not see value in that, but they did. And these are the ones they have. It's, they, they can go before the king. They have face with the king. And uh, it was one of the, they had free access to come and go before the king whenever they chose and whenever they pleased to. These are his most trusted advisors. This is as good as it gets. And honestly, they should have stopped and said, you know what, I think we need some relationship advice in here. And they didn't. They said, we need to issue an edict. We need a law. And they see this really as a more a king and queen issue than a husband and a wife issue. And that's why they go for the edict. They go for the law. You know, the law can force an outward conformity. We know it can. But it never changes the heart. And that's what they're leaning on. That's what they're hoping for. But it doesn't. It cannot change the heart. That's also good advice for all of us. But Mamukin is the one who comes up with this idea. Let's banish the queen. Let's just get rid of her. Give her position to somebody else who's more, honestly, compliant than she is. And we'll start over easy. And then we'll send out this edict that husbands everywhere are to be honored by their wives. It's almost like they look at this like an entire feminist movement is going to rise up overnight because of what this happening. Can you imagine? Like this, this, this is what they're afraid of. You know, and all of a sudden all the ladies are like, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, let's rise. And like oh, the entire Persian kingdom is going to go up in flames overnight because of this. They're certainly trying to save the king from some embarrassment, which I'm sure there was. I mean, all these guests that he has at his banquet, and he's feasting and, and enjoying this, this time together, and he's embarrassed, and they're probably a little bit embarrassed too, so they're trying to save him from that. But honestly, what would have probably amounted to a chuckle behind closed doors after the fact? The king, for all intents and purposes, takes out a full-page ad and sends it all throughout the empire that the king has absolutely no idea how to rule his own house. I mean, that's, that's the humor. It's like they would have been, he confirms the very rumor he's trying to cover up. And he's letting everybody know that this is going on and, and what has just happened. He's a fool. Can you imagine being in the town square? Because Persia had more or less what was known as like the Pony Express. They had the Persian Express. And, and so they would disseminate and they could, they could get riders dispatched very, very quickly. So probably within the week, News had reached like all the co corners of the empire. Can you can imagine though that that guy comes in there, the Persian Express rider comes in into the town square, and you're like, "Hear ye, hear ye!" Listen to the edict of the king, and then he goes on and reads what's contained here, and the townspeople must have been like, "What? What in the world is this?" Like looking at each other, like, uh, "Okay, like what in the world is going on here?" There's almost no way that Vashti could have ever imagined that her no would have such a massive impact and lead to such a heavy-handed decision. But again, all of this was necessary to put Esther in her place years later for such a time as this. You know, the reality is we see this, the people that were living there, we see our own time, and we think, man, I wish I longed for a better kingdom. I'd imagine the people living here, even the queen and others too, longing for a better kingdom. You know, Persian had a lot of the glitz and the glamour on the outside. It looked great, right? But on the inside, you start looking, you peel back a layer or two, and you realize it's an absolute hot mess inside. It's so dysfunctional. The people living there must have thought to each other that not the Medes and the Persians, but everybody else that they had conquered, like, how did they conquer us? 
This is a disaster. This is a mess. They conquered us. You have this weak king and insecure officials and massive wealth and, and this uh, consumed with pretty things and extreme excess and a failure to value what really matters. And we start reading that and think, wait, are we describing Persia or the United States? Are we describing Persia or the Western world? See, we all look and we long for a better kingdom. Ian Duguid said this. He said, this is the world that God's people often find themselves in over and over. The reins of power are in the hands of the incompetent, and in which we are guided at best by the amoral and worse by the immoral. And these events are going to heavily affect the lives of so many people, especially the Jews. And you know what? In the moment, they're oblivious to the entire thing. Day-to-day -day activities they're going to look at and say, this doesn't affect me at all. This has no bearing on my life. The fact that we have a queen or not a queen, it doesn't look like that big of a deal. And yet, years later, it will grow in importance. And what we find is the butterfly effect has begun. The butterfly has flapped its wings. Xerxes is trying so hard here to be God, to be what God is. He issues these absolute decrees, and he gives down these heavy-handed and stiff penalties that he really can't carry out. And we realize that God can carry those things out. He does give stiff penalties, but, but God does something and is something that Xerxes is not. God rules over his creation for the benefit of his creation. Certainly for his glory, but for the benefit of his creation, those who live underneath him. It's the best way to do life. Xerxes doesn't understand that. He can think of no one else but himself. And men and women have thrived under God's law and under God's principles, and civilizations collapse when they deviate too far away from what God has said. But God actually cares for the ones underneath his care. Xerxes doesn't. But we know that God cares because he sent his son into this world for us. And for those of us who are in Christ, we know that God works all things together for good. You know, as far as we know, that Vashti has no relationship with God. There's nothing to really suggest that she even knows who God really is. What happens to her is not for her good, but it is for theirs, and eventually for ours. Even though she likely did what was right, she doesn't benefit at all. For the Jews, though, God is taking this event and many more after it. Things that look on the surface like they're going to be terrible, and he will use it to bring great good to his people. One small event at a time. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That God will bring all those various events, bring them together for our good. And it's hard to understand sometimes. I think maybe the best way to understand that maybe is to look at making a cake or some other kind of a baked good. You ever take those ingredients out, you start, you know, gathering those things together, your flour and your oil and your butter and, and your sugar and, and all the other stuff that's in there? You know, you look at those ingredients and you know what they can become, but in the moment when they're sitting on the counter, the last thing you want to do is take a big scoop full of any of them and eat it, right? Like apparently flour can kill you now, right? You have to cook that all the time. And eggs, we already knew that. But, you know, oil, anybody just, like, look for oil? Like, man, I want to just slug that right now, like, Right? Even sugar, at least it's sweet. But the last thing you really want to do is just, it doesn't, it's sweet, but it doesn't really taste like anything. Like, none of it's really appealing. And you look at all these ingredients, and you're like, most of these are not good in any way, shape, or form in their current form. How are you going to improve that? And somebody who knows what they're doing takes a recipe, combines all those ingredients, fills it, fill, uh, puts it together, puts it in the oven, and that, that smell and that aroma of cake starts filling the house. And it comes out, and you're like, wow, what a difference. See, individually, none of those things were really good or valuable to us. We didn't like them. We didn't understand them. But God takes all of those things together and says, watch what I can do here. And we have to understand that Romans 8.28 is telling us that very thing. God works all things together for our good. See, individually, we might not be able to say that. But when you watch what God can do, he says, I will combine this with this with this with this. Now look at what comes out. And you're on the other side, and you've experienced that. You've gone through maybe some terrible times, some trials, some difficulties, and you think, now I see what God is doing. And I understand it, that truly God has worked this out for my good. 
And he will. How? I don't know. Because every situation and every event is unique. But he will do this. But you have to look for God's providence. You have to look for God's fingerprints all around you. What is it that God is doing? What is it that he is up to? And if you keep looking for the Red Sea, I promise you, you're going to miss it. You have to look for the subtle things, sometimes simply the word no. Alistair Begg said of this passage that God is most present when he appears to be absent. We have the hardest time believing that because we assume that God is absent when he appears absent. It's not true. You know, as we go through Esther, both today and for the next coming weeks, I hope you have some great lunch conversations. As you talk about the details, you talk about what is or is not going on in this, and ask the questions, consider the questions the narrator is not asking or answering or just suggesting, like, what does that mean for me? How does this work? I don't know. Consider all the things that in the moment seemed irrelevant. Why did the narrator put that detail there? Does it show up again later? Most of the time, the answer is yes. And it becomes significant. In the moment, it wasn't. But all these small interactions that feel so random, we realize that they're not. Even in your own lives, you can think back on this, like, how did you meet your wife? How did you get that job? Or why did you buy that car? Things that felt maybe like they were random or inconsequential in the moment. And you just think, wait, but God used these events, used these circumstances to bring this together, to cause this to happen. And they were things maybe in the moment you wrote off as not that big of a deal. Well, look at it again. See if they truly are not a big deal. See, at the end of the day, God is active everywhere. You just have to look for those fingerprints, but he is there. God can change your life with a no. And he's doing it. Rest in the confidence that God is working even when you can't see him. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and mercy allowing us to read the story of Esther. To be able to immerse ourselves in the context of what is going on there and seeing how you worked and how you provided for a nation that was certainly very disobedient. Lord, to be able to understand just a little bit how you can work through the smallest of events and details, something that we're going to pick up on over and over again, all throughout the book of Esther. Lord, I'm thankful for you revealing that to us, the encouragement that it is. Lord, I don't know all the bits and pieces of what people might be going through this morning, but you do. You know why each and every one is here. That they needed to hear this. They needed the encouragement. They needed to be challenged in their thinking. Lord, I pray that you would help them to find that great confidence in you. That you would be doing something in their hearts and lives, showing them who you are. And that you are active. But Lord, we have to trust. Help us, please Lord, to trust you. Rely upon you. And not try to take matters into our own hands, as we are so wanting to do. Thank you, Lord, for books and passages like this one in Esther that remind us again and again and again that you are God and we are not. In Christ's name, amen.